Well, thank you so much for having me here today with all of you. It is absolutely a pleasure. I have to say that this is my first time ever in Iowa. So, um, very, I know, it's very cool. I've been wanting to come to CornCon for a couple of years and with nine, uh, with COVID, that sort of made it a little bit challenging. Last year, we did a digital event uh, with all of you. We're gonna be talking today about emotional intelligence. I think the last 17 months for everybody has taken a toll on all of our emotional psyches. We have been going in different directions. We have been disrupted. Uh, our work style, work mantra, and how we're connecting with our colleagues and teammates and even our, just our companies in general have completely changed. What has always been amazing to me is how the cybersecurity professionals by nature are really just determined and incredibly intelligent people. They're really, you guys are quick thinkers as well. But because you guys are pattern oriented and, um, and very analytical and sometimes uh, introvert overall, the other side of the coin of your brain, emotional intelligence, doesn't necessarily come naturally for cybersecurity professionals. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about today. So one of the things that I've seen as a being in this profession for, or in this industry, I should say, for over two decades, uh, I'm not going to date myself, I have a whole little group of friends in the front row that predate me even more. Just kidding. <laughs> See if they're listening. They didn't even notice. Sure. <laughs> um, but understanding really how uh, the different generational aspects of our our cybersecurity professionals are. We have a whole young group of future cybersecurity professionals that are here from the local schools, and then certainly um, the ones that are up and coming, and of course the ones that are more established in leadership. The hardest thing that I have always found is harnessing emotional intelligence uh, and being able to practice it on a regular basis. Again, it's just not something intrinsic to cybersecurity and technology type of professionals, but I think as we kind of look at it, it's a lot more easier than we all thought if we kind of give it some practice. So let's just sort of talk through some terminology so we all get on the same page and what defines emotional intelligence. First, you have self-awareness. And that's really just about knowing your strengths, your weaknesses, your drivers, your values, and how you impact others. You have to stay aware of your emotions on an individual level. Then you have self-regulation. And this is really about your ability to control and redirect disruptive impulses and moods as well as manage behaviors and tendencies. Social skills, something that's not always natural for cybersecurity professionals, but there's always a connection, your ability to build a rapport with others that have desired common interests, and you really understand how, what, or what motivates you uh, in the quality of those relationships. Then of course you have empathy, um, and applying that and I think that's probably the most important thing about emotional intelligence is really the empathy factor. It's the ability to understand the other person's emotional makeup. So we're turning that table around and saying, what would I do if I were in their shoes? And then reacting in such a manner. So it's really reflective of moods and feelings because it really helps with building your trust and connections. And then, of course, you have motivation, which is really your personal drive to improve your common goals, your achievements, and really it's taking initiatives on. Um, and it's being optimistic as well. And more importantly, in today's post-COVID world, it's about being resilient. But being motivated and staying motivated is really um, the biggest challenge 
and certainly motivating others. So let's start to talk about the new normal and the great resignation. The new normal, I know all of us kind of hate that word because what was normal before versus normal now and all that, so I know it's a bit of a cliche. But cybersecurity professionals have really, as I mentioned, been viewed as that introverted individual who used their, their other intelligence uh, to build their knowledge and fight cybercrime. The typical movie image or stereotype of a cybersecurity professional is that person in the black hoodie, kind of dark against the bright screen, is just sort of looking there by themselves. But with the pandemic, that image, quite frankly, was all of us at different points in time, sitting in front of the computer screen, talking to our colleagues, trying to stay connected with our families, but at the end of the day, lacking human contact and being somewhat isolated. A lot of folks developed anxiety and depression definitely rose because of the isolation and the lack of human contact. As leaders, we've had to look at things in different ways. As a CEO of a company that was already actually a virtual company to begin with, but delivered in person events, I had to look at different ways of staying connected with my, my staff, my customers, and the executives that participated in our programs. We actually had to build out a whole new platform of digital programs that was not our core competency that took us through a lot of change and uh, transformation as a company, but it was key to our survival. People at large really reflect, you know, at this time, uh, like myself, and how they had to view the world. Just this morning, um, much like the great resignations that are out there, I lost my first employee in the pandemic to the great resignation. She decided that her calling was not being in cybersecurity, but helping to oversee a communications department in a cancer organization, a healthcare company. And I'm sad uh, at the end of the day that we, she's not gonna be on our team anymore. But I also was struck by the fact that she took the opportunity because she lost both her grandparents to cancer, and this was her way of helping to perhaps communicate and prevent cancer or cure cancer down the road. So what I've seen just across the board on the great resignation front is a lot of people had a lot of time to reflect and really decide what their calling might be, and it could be something completely different uh, at the end of the day. So this is gonna be the challenge moving forward and what kind of the conditions that we're working with. Because as we're seeing, one third of the workers under 40 have considered changing careers during the pandemic. 17% of the adults have already relocated their homes. And I really actually think that number's probably even higher because I actually am probably one of the last standing original neighbors in my neighborhood and I've lived there since 1999. Um, and I live in Georgia. And also, 55% of the workers wanted to return to the workplace, um, but many of them don't. Many have found, for a variety of reasons, that working remotely suits their lifestyle. They're not having to drive two plus hours commuting. Um, and now we have a, a mandate for businesses over 100 more people um, that has been posted as of yesterday to be vaccinated or be tested once a week. So for a lot of people, a lot of decision making is occurring and a lot of change is happening uh, at the end of the day as it comes back to whether or not we work in person together as a team, is it possible to work virtually, uh, not need all that expensive office space or all that travel, or is it really suitable for the company and their culture to work in person? And I think we're gonna have some real challenges ahead um, because I did spoke at a conference, uh, InfoSec Nashville, just a couple of weeks ago. And a 
couple of the employers there um, talked about bringing back the folks to the office. And they basically had another great set of resignations because they didn't want to go back to the office. And then I've heard from other people, they miss the contact with people. So again, as leaders and employers and teammates, we've got to be really thoughtful and work with each of us to apply empathy, to understand what's really right and what the new workforce is going to look, for, look like in cybersecurity. So talking through leadership, I think leadership is a journey. We're not born natural leaders. We're not born as a team lead. We're not born as a CEO. We grow to become those leaders. I see some common characteristics though that what makes us successful leaders. First and foremost, it's really understanding your, the business that you're working for. The most successful chief information security officers that I've ever worked aside with, or along with, I should say, are the ones that have an understanding, a full understanding, and could be the CEO of the companies in which they're, they're running the security organizations for. In that, they understand that security can be a business driver, a business enabler, a business differentiator, as well as a competitive advantage. So getting your team ready for those types of things. So having an understanding of how you as a security professional can add value to your company's supply chain or e-commerce operations, all those types of things, or your manufacturing process. The management of the team doesn't mean just being a taskmaster and a micromanager and just saying, hey, did you get your work done? My least favorite type of manager is ones that call you at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and say, what are you doing right now? It's true, right? You hated those people. Don't be one of those people. I always vow when I had the opportunity to run my own company and lead my own team, I would never call an employee on a Friday afternoon and say, what are you doing right now? If I were to call them because I needed to talk to them, I certainly would be hoping that they would be wrapping up their things to have a good weekend. Unless there was a special set of circumstances that had otherwise, but not for the sake of working. We have to build rapport with our team. And that's really hard right now when you are looking at a Zoom screen for eight hours a day or longer in different time zones and everything like that. We met, I do miss a lot of the in-person interactions and actually that's why I'm so glad when the opportunity came to be here with all of you today was I've missed the in-person as well. But what I've also had to learn in this journey is how to stay connected in a digital world. So one of the things that I've always returned to, and I think this is as security professionals really is important, is we go back to the basics. When in doubt, you always return to the fundamentals. When you're building your security staff and you're looking at it, you have to always go from the bottom up and go back to the core and the fundamentals. It's no different as a team in applying emotional intelligence. Applying this aspects of self-awareness. So here's some tips for you. First and foremost, ask for feedback. Ask, hey, how am I doing for you? Not in a, a looking for affirmation or self-affirmation or anything like that, but ask, how could I be helping you as a team leader or a team member to do better for you? And then kind of take those positives and ask for the positives and the negatives. Be conscious of the weaknesses and take the constructive criticism when you need to have it with open arms. And I know that's one of the hardest things I've had to do as a, a team a CEO, as well as being on the other side of the coin. Taking it personally can be really, really hard. Um, so you have to somewhat build a little bit of thick skin and the way you deliver 
constructive criticism is not to be hurtful or mean, but rather helpful and positive. Look about the, the hardest thing, I think, was one of the hardest things with the pandemic is the separation between work and life and life and work. A lot of us worked um, always in an office in a smaller, and then had a smaller dwelling like people that lived in, let's say, New York City or San Francisco. They may not have had a need for a separate workspace, but suddenly with the pandemic, you're working at your kitchen table, you're sitting in your bedroom, and you really don't have a delineation. And that's really hard. That was one of the things that, even though I had been working from home, but as John talked about, I was a total road warrior. So I had a delineation between going to something and then coming back. I think for me, one of the hardest things, even though I set up a separate, I had a separate workspace and had to completely redesign it so that it became a Zoom studio. I had to make sure that the lighting, for example, um, did not, was not behind me. I had a, my big picture window behind me and I loved that, but it didn't work for a Zoom call because it blacked out my face. And having good lighting and good posture and sitting in a chair, because it's hard sitting in a chair for several hours a day, so you have to have something good to sit on, not just at your kitchen table. I, at the beginning of time, I will tell you, I would be on a Zoom, several Zoom calls, and then be physically exhausted afterwards and just go to the couch and just pass out. And this is the same person that would get on an airplane for a 7 a.m. flight, fly across the country, deliver an ISC private dinner on the West Coast, so that would have been getting the, to the restaurant um, at 8.30 at night, because uh, they start at 5.30 at night, whatever time zone we're doing, and then coming back at 11.30, uh, my, my body clock time, and going back and then getting up again the next morning and flying on a plane at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning so that I could get back to the East Coast by 2 o'clock in the afternoon and not lose an entire day. The same person could not handle being on a Zoom call for several hours because I thought it was more exhausting. So I had to really look at the fundamentals and how to structure and delineate between day and night, work, work and life. And that was really hard. Some other things that I really learned about going back to the fundamentals but having to communicate on a digital platform was being really cognizant of your expressions. You can't just, it, that was, you can't really roll your eyes or you can't just, the whole aspect of the body language and the chemistry doesn't always come back to look at you because you're just seeing maybe your head with a, you know, a Zoom background or something like that. So it's harder to kind of gauge those reactions. You also, I also found it to be really difficult to be on camera all the time because you had to be on. And it was very hard to look down and do your work or take notes because your laptop was also the device that you were taking notes on. So you really had to change how you were working and communicating and participating in a meeting without looking like you weren't paying attention or care. And that, for a lot of folks, is really hard to do. You have to really think about practicing self-control because again, there's a barrier in terms of how you're working. Um, you're not at the same meeting table. So you can't just get up and walk to the other side and show somebody on the computer. You have to do something like a screen share. But one of the things I will say, and my friends over there at that table always will say about me, I always like to look at a glass half full versus half empty. You have to look at life at the positives versus the negatives because that's one of the things about self-regulation and how you're going to continue to stay motivated and motivate um, the, others, the other folks around you. And that's really something I really work and hard, work hard to strive for every single day. Um, 
Yeah. Does it say is it say uh, when in doubt return? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry. I can't see what's up on the screen, and my I don't have my glasses on, so the slide on my thing is very small. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, good deal. Awesome. Thank you very much. One of the things I've also learned about staying motivated is really setting measurable goals that are reasonable to obtain. It's really easy to become very overwhelmed about things when you just have this huge horizon looking out and you feel like you can't get anything done. One of the things that I've noticed in the cybersecurity world, just in general, around especially security uh, SOC analysts, for example, or those that are um, dealing with all the alerts, is the challenge of feeling of anything getting accomplished and the importance of actually automation uh, in, in the SOC to help prevent this fatigue that comes with it. People just inherently have to feel like they've accomplished something to get something the next part done. Even if it's something simple, just checking off your checklist. But with a very fast paced environment that has a lot of, or lack thereof of automation, that fatigue can really step in into play. And you end up chasing a lot of squirrels instead of putting out a lot of fires. Another thing, and I know many of you guys know this from being part of our ISC awards over the years, and. We're going to be bringing them back in 2022, and our, we kicked off our nomination. So for those of you that have uh, some projects that you've been kind of storing up, and obviously leadership, uh, celebrating your results is the best way to really honor and respect your team and all the hard work that you guys have done, uh, especially during this time period. But it's important to take a step back and reflect on, your, on what has been accomplished. I look at, um, you know, back, so March 5th, 2020, our last ISC private dinner um, was in Nashville, Tennessee. And there's a lot of health care there. We had a lot of cancellations uh, of cybersecurity executives that were in the health care space because they were trying to figure out what the heck was going on. But there are a lot of them that still did come. And they're all just sitting there dumbfounded. And I have to get our company up and running remotely in 48 hours or less. Oh my God. And we are not a remote company by nature. And the stress level for that was un unbelievable. And people figured it out. They work tirelessly. And take a moment now, you know, to reflect and perfect, but celebrate those results. At the end of the day, having tangible rewards out there is really is important because you have to have to you have to look at it from a perspective that we are somewhat operating in an intangible world right now. It's really about being motivated and really being, figuring out what those personal rewards might be. Tell a friend or a coworker really how you're gonna get something done and then follow up that you got it done. Or in reverse, they tell you something like that. And take the time to send a quick text and say, hey, how did it go today? The hardest thing I also found during this time period is keeping your team motivated. In the darkest of dark times, during the early days of the pandemic, I have to tell you I was scared. Um, I did not know a lot about digital events. They were kind of daunting to me. I've never really been on camera before, and I had never even had a Zoom account. Opening that first time with that free Zoom account, I don't know, it was both frightening and exhilarating. So I reached out to some girlfriends and said, hey, let's have a Zoom cocktail hour. So I sat out of my big deck in the backyard with some wine and cheese 
on a Friday afternoon, I'm like, I have to learn this product if I'm gonna survive as a company, as a CEO, and, and pretend to move forward. So we just talked to each other on Zoom. I have never done a video phone call like that, ever. All of our conference calls have been, at that to that point, were really just what they were, conference calls. My team probably was equally as frightened and they were looking to me for leadership, encouragement, and that was something hard to do because I didn't know where I was going. If it wasn't for my husband, who just kind of looked me in the eye and said, you're gonna pick yourself up and do it, we wouldn't have done it. We had Google calling us, a little 14 person company that is comprised of women asking us for digital round tables and some type of whatnot. Um, we figured it out. We sold them 10 of them. And we were doing digital, well, we call them ISE cocktails and conversations. And we even got Google to do it on Zoom. So encouraging your team and being a leader in the darkest of times with how really seeing a horizon is a true test of leadership. But I also, throughout the time, encouraged my team for self-care. So if there was an opportunity after they might, there might have been a shutdown, where it was like in Georgia, we reopened America first, so we were able to get some of the first haircuts <laughs> and nail appointments in the country. It was a big deal, let me tell you. So I know, but you have a bunch of women that work for you, these are kind of important things. Um, but in all seriousness, I said, if you can get an appointment to go get your haircut, you go get a haircut at two o'clock in the afternoon and you're not taking any PTO. Just make sure that your meeting, your clients are still taking, or your teammates know what's happening so that they can make sure that you enjoy that haircut and you enjoy that nail salon appointment and you go do it. And actually, I think at the end of the day, they appreciated that because they did have to take a Saturday, a coveted Saturday appointment, they could just go on a Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock, I didn't really care. And in all fairness, I was so happy I called Rob, my hair guy, hairdresser Roger, and he was like, sure, I'll happy to give you an appointment that's not needed at that time because he had other customers that really didn't need a Saturday appointment. So talking through some of the social skills. Again, inherently, Cybersecurity technology people are not social. My first time going to an ISSA meeting in Atlanta, and I'm an outgoing kind of marketing communications person. I'm very comfortable speaking to all of you today. I was, and I loved networking and built, I mean, I call my company a relationship marketing company. So I come into the room, and there I am, everyone's sitting down during supposed to be the networking hour, eating a sandwich, their little sandwiches, waiting for the presentation to start. And they were doing that for a full hour. And I'm, so I was stunned that they would not talk to each other and go from table, they just sat at their little tables, their classroom style tables, I should say, and just didn't talk to anybody, didn't talk with the person next to them. So I just kind of went around, because they really didn't want a sandwich. I just started around and started shaking everybody's hands and saying hello and introducing myself. So you kind of have to go outside of your comfort zone too to do some of those things. And I don't mean it in a mean way, but actually some of them started to get up, started to talk to each other after we kind of, I went through and sort of said hello. And then the next time I attended one of their the meetings, I actually saw them sort of not sitting down and started to talk to each other. Unfortunately, Zoom right now doesn't allow for a lot of that stuff. But what I would encourage you to do is to chat with each other in the chat window and have a sort of side conversation. Not to be a distraction if there's something going on, but just use it as an alternate way to ask a question or say something that might not be needed to be said, could be, should be said uh, in the team meeting. One of the hardest things to do in uh, on Zoom is really having good eye contact and active listening skills. So 
So it can be done in video meetings, but really focus, it, it, you have to think about how you are, again, taking those notes, how you are engaging, um, how you look on camera. But also there might be times when you don't need to be on camera and you can actually have a normal conversation and not be something out of the Jetsons. Ask folks questions, not yes or no, but open-ended so that you get a better understanding and a perspective of what they're thinking and how they're approaching it. My favorite part, again, of emotional intelligence is applying empathy. As everyone knows that knows me, I love shoes. So I have lots of shoes, and that's something of a bit of a fetish of mine. But what I'll do when I'm thinking about it is put myself in somebody else's shoes. So how would they like to be talked to? How would they like to be considered? So in the situation right now with my communications director leaving us, we are gonna have a team meeting on Monday morning to figure out the next steps in the course, to chart the course together. Because me just saying I'm gonna bring in a new hire, I don't know if that's right for us. I need to hear what they have to say and how they wanna move forward. We're going to certainly miss the person, their, lead, their, their team leader, but at the same time, they've been part of my company for many, many years. So I feel like their voice matters, and I have to apply the empathy and hear what they have to say to help us chart forward. Try to do weekly check-ins with your colleagues. Don't call them, as I said, at 5 o'clock on Friday and go, what are you doing right now? But have a moment, just kind of set some time aside to say hello or send a quick text. It just helps for them to stay connected. Also, be, don't be cold and stone. Share a little bit of your feelings. Tell them, not overshare, but certainly if they're something that they're coming to you and they want to talk to you about, apply that empathy to them. So I always feel like you always have to, when in doubt, return to the fundamentals. So what about now? You have people fluctuating. They want to stay home. They want to work in the office. Their children are kind of in Zoom no land or uh, purgatory as well. They might have sports, but they're on lockdown from school. And then you're trying to juggle a million things and figure out your work day and all that. People also are missing human contact. They're missing just seeing a face-to-face -face smile. And the biggest thing I know I missed during all this is hugs. And I got a lot of hugs last night and I got a lot, a lot of hugs today. So get my hug quota uh, in. <laughs> but the lack of human contact with people has taken a toll on people. And we can't forget that uh, at the end of the day. So this is where emotional intelligence becomes even more important than it did, let's say, pre-pandemic. You really have to be extra cognizant of voice intonations and how you are coming across what you're doing on camera or not doing on camera, and then just trying to stay connected. So. Overall, go, you're going to have to go a little bit harder and a little bit extra to stay connected with your teammates and colleagues um, and do so in a non-obtrusive manner. So check up and check in and a lot has changed since 20, the beginning of 2020. Um, give yourself an honest emotional intelligence checkup as well. Despite some of the hardships and changes that we've had in 2020, take a moment to say, hey, what did I do well in 2020? Or some new skills that I might have developed. What about my team? In 2020, as I talked about earlier, I really wasn't necessarily comfortable being on camera. Well, that is pretty much what I do a lot of the day for our digital events. I'm so comfortable with it. I've been doing news interviews and different things like that. That's a new skill that I probably wouldn't have had if COVID did not happen. 
So look at the positives. Remember, look at that glass half full. Emotional intelligence is not something you just sort of pop in and pop out of it. What I have to say is you have to think about it daily so that, or apply it daily, so that it becomes natural and an inherent part of you. I did not realize all that at first when I started thinking about emotional intelligence actually back in 2018 when I was first asked by Eric Perimeter, who, uh, oh, ICMCP, and um, he said, Marcy, I think you should do a presentation for our conference on emotional intelligence. And I said, emotional what? And I didn't really know anything about it. So I went to Amazon, like everyone does, and I don't go to the library anymore, and bought a bunch of books. And I was like, well, some of this is just so common sense that I already do a lot of it. And then actually some of it was just kind of thinking about it from a perspective of it makes a lot of sense. So here we are several years later, and I have to tell you that I tell people that I live and die by emotional intelligence. I think about how I interact with people uh, in a manner and how I'm gonna present myself or work with my teens through using emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence still stands strong in 2021. And uh, it's really about its mental health and applying it in such a way as we carry forward as can make a world of difference for you. Before you go into a difficult conversation or a meeting or a positive one, take a moment to reflect and say, what does this mean for the other person that I'm about to share this news with? And how do I want to deliver it? Obviously, a natural thing of being excited is awesome, but you can't run down the office necessarily for some folks right now. And some folks may never go back to the office. So think about a way of how to deliver both positive, neutral, and negative news. So also think about the impact that you have in other people's lives. And I'll say from the poet Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And those are some very strong words overall. I have to believe that you stand out as empathetic to when you're an employer and a leader. I've learned more about being a leader in the last 17 months than I probably could have ever learned in all the time I was at Babson College. I've learned how to lead, what really leading from the front is, and I've also had to learn that you have to be strong in times of crisis, but you also have to be a real person. You really have to apply those traits because you want your team to stay with you. And you retaining talent is incredibly hard right now. There's a lot of opportunities. We talked about the great resignation where there's an awakening going on with our younger folks who have a different, find out that they have a different calling than the one they might be working with you for. Workers and employees and team members really still want to stay with organizations that connect with them beyond the technical skills. And I really do believe that. There's a lot there about leveraging your personal strengths and, and weaknesses. I always say that a team, well, you look at a baseball team, not everyone's the first baseman, not everyone's the pitcher, not everyone's the catcher. If you had a team full of catchers, well, there'd be no pitchers. If you did have somebody in the outfield catching those fly balls, you'd have a lot of home runs. And your first baseman would be pretty much kind of sacked. So you have to look at how you build out your teams and make the investment in the teams and look at how to complement their strengths and weaknesses. We've already added a lot of complexity to things out there right now, but let's sort of talk about some fun ways or great ways of staying connected with your team uh, overall. Not necessarily having a Friday meetings on a Friday afternoon or something maybe random during the week on Wednesday afternoon so that 
they can actually get some other things done. Be respectful of the fact that you're, you might be working from home, but your child might be coming home from school and you need to meet them at the bus stop. So maybe that happens at three o'clock. So don't have a meeting start at three o'clock. Just simply ask, would it work for you to meet at home and you know, for us to meet at 3.30 instead? So having an understanding of a little bit of the work-life challenges that might exist right now. There was one friend of mine, good friend of mine, um, that's a chief information security officer. The beginning of all this was very adamant that they had to wear, they come from the banking world. They had to be all dressed up to be on Zoom. And if they weren't on dressed up on Zoom on camera, they weren't working. And that kind of takes a mindset from being at a big financial institution um, into your own home. But the reality is your life kind of went upside down. It's quite possible you could fit in a run or go to yoga class where you had a, your child is needing a snack or help with their homework and they can't be on camera. It takes a long time to get ready to look like this. <laughs> it does. But at the end of the day, be thoughtful. Maybe you pre-determine pre whether that meeting really has to be on camera. Can it be accomplished by an old-fashioned conference call? And maybe you might actually get more done because you can get a workout in and sort of feed your child and still be Mr. Mom or Mrs. Mom and sort of be the wonder at the getting everything done. We're in an industry that puts people in the spotlight when something goes wrong. It's up to us as leaders really to flip that perspective on its head. Studies show that 70% of people are more motivated by recognition than money. So let's make sure we talk to them about that. Praise the work and really listen to them. Take the time about and listen to their ideas and that does pay dividends and engagement and loyalty. Let's think about being positive and constructive versus destructive. As the saying goes, people lead managers, not companies. And that usually goes wrong with the emotional, not financial aspects. Changing our mindsets is about being more empathetic. And flexibility will help us improve our retention the fasting the face of a great resignation situation in the hybrid workforce. Also look at changing how your team and transforming them. It's really easy for our security team to become encumbered with a lot of negativity or even being dreading um, the work that they're over doing because they're overwhelmed with lots of different things going on. And they're not able to touch it the same way that they might have been before. We all have to keep in mind, cybersecurity is a business enabler. We've come a long way over two, almost three decades now. So treat it like one. To me, it's a competitive advantage. When something goes well, reward that success. And go one step further and tell your board, if that works for you, about those achievements. When something goes wrong, well, if you kind of live in a world that's always kind of saying chicken little's going to fall, the ceiling's falling. But create a constructive learning experience for all involved. Practice those tabletop exercises so when the horrible day might happen, you're ready for it and you're ready to take charge. And use that time when the pressure's not necessarily on to say, hey, what should I have done better and differently? And use that to use cybersecurity as a business enabler. Use that as an opportunity to maximize your strengths and correct the issues. Digital transformation is not slowing down. In fact, our current cloud trends and workforce is demanding it right now. But barriers to digital transformation can be simply technological. The greatest challenges for us to overcome will be the human aspects of change. And emotional intelligent leaders that practice emotional intelligence will absolutely overcome it. So here's some things about the cynics out there. Um, there's always those people that don't want to get on board, don't want to change their ways, but they'll try to influence their colleagues by calling out the huge flaws. Again, 
look at that glass half full and work towards a shared goal. For us at 10, that shared goal was turning our in-person events to a digital set of events, a platform of them to, to as best as possible to emulate the experience of the in-person experience so that we can stay connected, we can collaborate and celebrate. All these types of things can only foster a positive change. Remember, your greatest risk isn't the external threats that we see as cybersecurity professionals. It's not the insider threats. It's really the dispassionate teams that don't operate at maximum potential. So we need to put those soft skills to use, create those connections, identify those strengths and weaknesses, and build the teams into a, pos a positive working unit, making it that World Series champion baseball team. Uniting such a spirit to disperse teams behind a common vision requires leadership. Leaders that have interpersonal skills to engage with people despite the barriers, but by rational and emotion. This is especially true for the creative types, the technology types, and those that want to harness the emotional energies of their team essential to the creative process. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Well, the important, I mean, you don't sit down and interview them because that would be very unnerving, I think, for somebody. But I think the natural process of getting to know them and becoming becoming a, a, a strong acquaintance for them, finding your commonality. So one of the things I always realize is my, my employees are not my friends, right? And that, you have to keep that distance. But I care about them like I would my family because they are everything. But you also have to realize when you are overstepping a boundary and if they want to share something with you, listen, take the time to listen, stop what you're doing and listen. If they want to share something extremely personal with you, make sure you're doing nothing else but listening to them. And then when they ask for your thoughts about the situation, then you offer that. But not be, like there'd be no way that I would ever call any of my employees and say, and I know they might be having, let's say, a marital problem or a personal health problem. I would never call and be obtrusive to those situations. If they wanted to talk to me about it or something, you know, because it was inhibiting them from work or they needed some time off, that's, I'll let them talk to that. But that's not being proactive is being listening and being that, that sounding board for them, but not picking up the phone and telling them, you need to go do this. And that's why personally I feel like the mandates with the vaccinations are extremely unconsciousable and very obtrusive because I don't want to know the medical history of each and every one of my employees, but I provide 100% health care so that they can have access to good health care. And that's between them and their doctor. So that's how I apply the emotional intelligence. Hopefully that answered your question. Mostly. Okay. Exactly. So that I, I think I understand what you're saying. So you have to be careful that you're not, if it's a interpersonal relationship where you're crossing the boundary, where you're feeling like it might be sexual or uh, too friendly or something like that. Is that what you're sort of asking? Okay. Um, I tend to take a step back when that happens and I sort of just listen and process and sort of say, okay, you know, I just, I don't know how I, I try to react as best as possible because it's happened certainly for sure. 
But is, you know, you try to position it in a way is, are they just trying to be your friend and tell you something very confidential? Or are they asking, asking you something that they might need some assistance with? And that's where you sort of have to sort of work with them to gauge that in the conversation. And then apply it appropriately. Does that? Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, Marcy, but if I had not had just heard you say cocktails and conversations was the first time you've done it, I would not have believed it. You guys did a great job with that. And that actually helped me throughout the pandemic because that gave me the ability to meet with my peers. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for saying that. I was frightened to death when I turned on that camera uh, that was sitting in front of my desk. <laughs> I've never been there before. And um, I have to tell you, my husband um, removed everything around in my office, put on this huge flat screen, like smart TV that takes up the entire wall. And we bought a Zoom camera, which was so hard to get at first, and a ring light. And basically, you walk in the office and it looks like a, a studio for like a news show or something because there's a desk there and everything like that. And arrange the bookcase and. Um, it's a little voyeuristic if you really think about your, you know, if you don't have a background up. But there's now the blurry background, which is kind of nice if your bookcase is a little messy. My desk is, has gotten very messy, so I sometimes put the blurry background on. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, sure. If this is like the approach for technical, it's like maybe HR focus. Um, I think HR people are, you know, the soft skills of the emotional intelligence, so they're the ones theoretically supposedly supposed to be practicing this. Um, not all of them are able to do it. I think overall there's a tremendous disconnect, which is a whole other conversation between HR and most departments. I think uh, especially with technology, especially so with cybersecurity. One of the things I've seen over the years is they really don't understand how to hire a cybersecurity professional. They want to go off a checklist and totally don't know what they're reading and understanding what to prioritize. And they get really hung up on the education component uh, overall. And that really frustrates me being involved. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to get off the stage. Um, frustrates me because I've been involved with a lot of technology work, uh, career type of programs that jumpstart like a boot camp that takes a high school grad that may have worked for a few years but did not was not able to go to college and teach them some great like marketable skills like ServiceNow and Salesforce.com and front end development and things like that. And then in 12 weeks they're being hired by top companies because there's a short a shortage of work, you know, the workforce that are high demand skills. And I think a lot of HR folks don't understand how that really works with technology. So that's a whole other topic for probably for another great presentation of another day. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'll be around tonight, and I hope I see you. Oh, did you have a question, Richard? I have two. Oh, okay. Be quick, be quick, be quick, okay. Be quick. My, my question is quick. Her answer, who knows? <laughs> uh, was this reporting for people who were not making it here today? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. That would yes, be. We're, we are recording this. Excellent. Number two, and this is the important thing. When are you doing a TED Talk? When did I do what? It's a TED Talk. I've never it's done a TED Talk. Oh. I think you should. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I don't even know how to really sign up to do one, so. Uh, let's talk. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much. I'm very flattered because those are pretty amazing to do. I've watched them before and it's in total awe. Well, thank you for having me today. I hope you enjoyed my session and I'll see you later.